What's going on, everyone? I hope you are well and welcome to another episode where today I am very proud, very, very proud to be celebrating seven years of recovery, being clean and sober from all mind altering substances. And I wanted to do this episode because I wanted to talk about my journey, my journey in recovery, how I came into it, how I found it the good, the bad, the ugly, how it is today. And it's it's been a very interesting journey. But first and foremost, let me tell you this. If you're listening or you're watching and you're struggling with any form of addiction, whether that's drug, alcohol, sex, food, shopping, gambling, smoking, whatever it may be, let me tell you something. Recovery is possible. But one of the things that I learn and continue to learn is it takes work. It actually takes easier work to live this kind of life than the hard work that it took for me to be in my addiction. And I'll get to that. It was such a relief when the penny dropped for me, when I realized so 12th of June is my sobriety birthday, and I came in seven years ago. Actually, I came in before June. Um, I think it was around about April time when I first discovered the 12-step meetings, and <clears throat> I wasn't particularly driven to any of them. I tried them all. I tried Alcoholics Anonymous. I tried Narcotics Anonymous. I tried... Uh, cocaine anonymous and i found my home and my home is when i need a meeting if there is a meeting there that's where i'll go to the place that i found a regular um place for myself was ca ca was the one for me which is cocaine anonymous and you know it, it worked for me but i have so much love and respect for every 12 step fellowship because they do incredible work and it's such a, a great place to be if you want to find recovery. So for me, I started this journey, as I said, seven years ago, and I did it because I met my wife. Some of you may already know the story, so I'm not going to go too much into detail of that, but we, we met on Tinder because I'm a sex addict and I was fulfilling my addictions. I, at the time when we met, I was addicted to sex, drugs, alcohol, food. I wasn't so much on, on the gambling side, but I pretty much blew my money on everything else. Smoking, shopping, clothes, you name it, shoes, anything else you can kind of think of. So, you know, there was kind of no excuses for me really. And, and one of the things I learned is sometimes we like to see the differences and not the similarities. And that actually kept me away because when we first met, we met on Tinder, we spoke a few times on, on the app, and then we moved away from the app and we started to, we just pretty much just jumped on a call. We were quite keen to, to speak to each other. And Lucy revealed her story to me. And, and it was a such a powerful story that really told truth and honesty and vulnerability and it hit me inside it really i really connected and resonated with it and i later then understood that that's what the the 12 step program is all about you know it's a track attraction rather than promotion and i was really attracted to that because it was something that i was seeking and I was seeking that for years. You know, I, I spent over a decade in, in, in my addiction. I was addicted to things even from a young age. I was addicted to sugar. I was addicted to cookies, ice cream, chocolates. And I struggled with my weight. I was, you know, quite chubby as a kid then lost some weight then put it back on again. And I became a little bit obese and I needed to, you know, to, to train, lose the weight, I lost it. But I was always, whether it was my weight, whether it was relationships, whether it was food, whether it was alcohol, and then eventually in my late 20s, I didn't found drugs. I was working in a very competitive, highly stressed, it paid incredibly well industry. And I, I needed, I was seeking, I was seeking something. I was seeking to 
to this validation because I always wanted to be part of. I was a huge people pleaser and always wanted to be part of the crowd, always wanted to, you know, to feel as though people liked me and they loved me because I I never I could never see that for myself. My self-confidence and my self-esteem with certain areas of my life was absolute rock bottom, where in other places it was being more driven by fear and ego. And I I just try to kind of get through life. I, I, I realized even now, even today, that I've always been a kind person. I've always been very smiley. I've always been very friendly. But I hid a lot of my pain in that. You know, a lot of people who know me, and if you see me, I'm always smiling, always very optimistic. And I even laugh and say that whoever creates us, I think, got distracted and kind of overdid it on the optimism cup slightly because I always see the best in people. I always see the best in everything. And that was great for me, but it also, it caused me a lot of pain because people couldn't see what was truly going on for me. And when I shared that, I think people just saw it as, oh, you'll be okay. This is Alex. You know, he's always so happy. He's, you know, he's, he's kind of he's always so much fun, always very positive, always, you know, very kind. But deep inside, I was, it was, it was almost like this secret, this deep secret inside me that because people saw me that way, I was so embarrassed and so ashamed to for people to see that because I was scared and petrified that people won't like me, that they will leave, that I will be made fun of, you know, I'll be shamed, I'll be embarrassed. So I didn't really share that. I was never really open about it. And there were so many other things that I kept, the deeper secrets. I really kept that stuff to myself because I thought, God, if they find this out and they're going to react in that way, imagine if people know some of the real dark stuff. And um, so for me, I was always seeking. And what I was seeking the most was that validation. But I was also seeking to numb. I wanted to numb this pain that I was for me, it felt like I was constantly in. And I don't want to paint as though my life was this really bad negative thing because it wasn't. I actually had a really lovely childhood and I didn't grow up in, you know, a mum and dad house. I actually grew up in my grandparents' house, but I grew up in a huge family. I grew up in Brazil, very humble beginnings. We were poor, but I I was shown love by my grandmother. I was shown love by people in my family, but there were also struggles there. You know, with my mom, my relationship, you know, our relationship was a struggle sometimes. And there were times when I, I didn't feel that we were connected. And today things are, are very different. So I don't want to paint, you know, her in any any form of, of a bad light. But I always like to share the, the, the open and, and honest truth because... That's the reality. And the reality that we all face is that we all struggle emotionally. We all suffer, you know, through some form of emotional pain, whether that's fear, resentment, anger, frustration, whether it is, you know, whether we are just feeling sad, just this deep trauma and pain. There are so many different ways in which we suffer and often or not, we suffer in silence. And that's one of the things that I did. I suffered in, in silence and, and it took me all of this time to eventually find a woman. Imagine this. I find a woman scrolling on Tinder. We match. I think, gosh, she's hot. And <laughs> she matches with me. We start having a conversation and, and things then began to change because we went on a date. I inquired, oh, so, you know, you said you're in recovery. What is, what's it all about? And she sort of described it to me about the 12 step program and that, you know, you have a book and there are meetings and they call it kind of unity service recovery, which I'll get to. And I thought, oh, this sounds interesting because for me at that point in my life, I've been in this, this addictive experience for over a decade. I tried to commit suicide. I'd had overdoses and I was literally at that point, just living to die. I was you know, just, I was numb. I was completely numb. I, you know, I, I built so many barriers. I had no boundaries and I was trying to protect myself in the best way that I could. And, but I was suffering more and more and more. And, and thank God for this optimism that always kept me going. And there was always something there that said to me, there was just a deep voice, just something inside me that says, keep going, keep going, just don't give up. 
please don't give up. Don't do the suicide anymore. Don't do the, the overdoses anymore. Keep going. And I trusted that. I trusted that voice. I trusted that process somehow. And I said, okay, right, well, let's just, let's just keep going. You know, there are parts of life, which I, I do love, for example, my children, you know, my son and daughter who, who were younger at that time, they're now 25 and 18. And, and there was that pain there of never feeling good enough as a father, never feeling good enough that I was there for them properly. And, you know, just, just never really feeling like I, I I knew that I could be better. I knew that I could do more. And I just didn't know how to. I was stuck. I felt like I was stuck in the mud and I was sinking. And thank God, you know, I, I, I met Lucy because through her, I started to inquire about this, you know, this, what's this 12-step program? What are these meetings all about? You know, what's this book? Let's go and find out. And I did. I went to a meeting one day with her and I turned up and it freaked me out it freaked me out <laughs> because it was in the church it was in a church i'm sat there and they gave me this reading which is um which is we can recover and it and it outlines the 12 step program and it's a beautiful reading but the because i came in full of fear really scared and didn't really know what to expect the first things that i saw was i was in a church which freaked me out because I thought, oh God, I really don't need religion in my life. Like this stuff isn't going to save me. And then all I saw was the word God. There was the word God everywhere in the 12 steps and the 12 principles. I picked up that reading and the only thing I could really see was the word God. And it was frightening because I remember saying to myself, what the f is God going to do for me? Because up until this point, God's done nothing. So I believed, which is not true, but I cursed and I was angry. I was angry at Christ. I was angry at God. I was angry at these religious places that supposedly, you know, they're here to save us and they're here to, to protect us and to guide us. And, you know, and in fact, look at me, you know, like I'm out, I was in victim mode. Look at me. I'm dying. I, I don't, I don't want to be here. And I kept questioning life all the time. Why the hell am I in this place? This doesn't make sense. I hate my life. And I came in, I went to the meeting, heard some really interesting things, but there were other people there who were doing different drugs and they were crack addicts and they were heroin addicts and they were, and they were doing other things, but they were also doing some of the things that I was doing. But I chose at that time, and I say this in the, in the rooms, I saw the differences, not the similarities. And I remember then coming out of the meeting and, you know, Lucy and I were talking, we went home and... I thought, right, let me give this a go. And I went to one or two more meetings, but then I thought, you know what? This isn't for me. I got knowledge now that, yes, I have a problem with with, with drugs, but I'm okay with everything else because drinking was the last thing for me. And interestingly enough, drinking was one of the things that almost killed me. And through all of this, you know, this was months. This was kind of April, May, June. And then eventually got to that point for me where it was like, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. And by this point, Lucy and I, had, you know, the, we, we had split up because she had to put a boundary in place. She had to look after herself, look after her recovery, because that's important. And what was interesting about that <clears throat> wasn't that she had split up from me was the fact that she was putting a boundary in place to make sure that she was okay, that she was safe, that she was protected, that she was looking after her recovery because her recovery is more important than anything. And I really respected that. And it really hurt me. And I was heartbroken. And I was, you know, I was an idiot. I was misbehaving. I was still kind of in that addictive behavior, still going now, I'll do what I want. You know, I'll still follow my own path. And and I carried on just kind of going on dates and doing stupid things. And I kept drinking and, and, and misbehaving. And eventually I thought, what the hell am I doing? And this is when I started to then creep into this point where I, and I say this very openly, that if I had a gun in my house, I would have shot myself. This is God honest truth. And I would never, ever do that to myself today. I love my life so much. And I realized the importance of living, the importance of being here, the just how precious life is. I understand that now so much. And I will get to how I found this out that I, I just, it, it just, it, it blew my mind. And 
I had to, to discover this for myself. So, you know, and also as well, you know, I, I wanted to let go of that old life because it wasn't serving me anymore. I was just in pain. I was going to dates that just didn't mean anything. And I was, you know, I was, it, it, I was doing things every day that had no purpose to me. It didn't feel me anymore. I was just constantly empty and I wanted to stop running on empty. And I wanted to start to feel this abundance cup, this love cup, you know, this, this cup of health, wealth, abundance, prosperity. I wanted to start filling myself up with this stuff, but I needed to do the work first. And that's when I reached out for help. And that's the hardest thing to do. That was the hardest thing for me to do after coming in and out, in and out of these rooms and asking for help. And the one person that picked up the phone to me, thank God, is Lucy. And she picked up the phone to me. I explained where I was and I was in a lot of pain at the time. And I got to a meeting the next day. And that's where my journey truly then began. You know, I phoned my then sponsor, who's like a mentor. This individual helps me to go through the 12 step program. And this person really helped me, really, really helped me. I'm so grateful to this individual, even today. And he took me through the 12-step program. You know, he took me through the 12-step program. He showed me everything that I needed to, to, to learn. And one of the things he said to me is, you learn what the book says. You will learn in meetings. You will learn, you know, other people. Everybody has an opinion. But the most important thing, if you want to stay in if you want to stay recovered, as they call it, if you want to, to, to be clean and sober every single day of your life, you do what this book says. And at that time, I was so scared. I was so petrified. I did not want to go back to that life. So I trusted him. I trusted the process. And they say it in, in the rooms. And the three things he said to me, which I still carry to today, is trust God, clean house, help others. And I understood and I learned what that meant when I started working through the 12 steps. And I started working through it and understanding, reading through the book. And I started to see so many similarities, especially with Bill Wilson, who wrote the book, you know, with other fellows. Uh, I think it's over 80 years now. You know, this book is incredible. Even when I pick up the book with a sponsee or just pick up the book to have a read, it still it jumps out. There are so many things in that book that even today makes so much sense. And it, it, it's phenomenal. Honestly, I cannot stress it enough how powerful that book is. Even as a as a as a life lesson, even just teaching you about life, like how to live a better life. That's pretty much what that is, and it really serves an incredible purpose. And one of the the key things that I learned from that is it takes daily work. It takes daily work. And that's something that I learned. And many of you who have worked with me, who work with me, who, who follow my, my, my content, you will see I mention doing daily work all the time. Why? Because I learned this through the 12 steps. And then I learned this continuously through doing meditation, learning mindfulness meditation with the Buddhist monk. You know, this guy taught me and showed me about mindfulness, about meditation, about healing internally from within, sitting in stillness about love, kindness, compassion, forgiveness. And I started to then embark. But one of the things that I learned and I want to share, this is such an important point, whether you are struggling with addiction or whether you're suffering from mental health, whether you're trying to get fit and strong in mind, body, spirit, it doesn't matter. This applies to everything. Even in business, it takes daily work. It takes daily work. So it's so important that whatever you choose to do in life, it's going to require you to put daily work into it. And that's something that I just, it registered and I stayed with it. And for me, I'm one of these people that I'm either all in or I'm all out. So there's no kind of in between for me. I did the all between thing and I hate it. It's like when I get a cold, I like to just, just give me the whole cold. I don't like the man flu thing because it's in that in between stage. I hate it. It really annoys me. So I'm that kind of person where I'm all in or I'm all out. So when I made a conscious decision and effort, because for me, 
there was no in between phase anymore. There was no oh, you know, I can I can I can deal with the suffering and I can live in suffering. There was no living in there anymore. For me, there was two simple choices: live or die. That was it. And I gave myself the choice to live. I said, What's the worst that can happen? And that's the one thing that I said to myself when I did my first line. Well, what's the worst that can happen? It's only a line, it'll be fine. And in the end, I ended up here and I said the same thing and it paid off because seven years now, here I am sitting here talking to you, doing this podcast, living this incredible life, but it took daily work. And one of the things I always like to mention, because people who come into the 12 step program, they come into these meetings and these fellowships, what they don't understand is, you know, they think that you just come in and you just do the meetings. No, that's not how it works. A lot of people, and I see it time and time and time again, people who come into meetings and they just go to meetings and they think they're going to get clean and sober through that. Absolutely not. The solution is in that book and it takes daily work but the meetings are also very important why because when we're struggling with mental health when we're struggling with addiction um undealt with trauma all of the things that we haven't looked at we're filled with anger resentment frustration sadness fear our ego is through the roof because that's what's keeping us alive we separate ourselves from everybody else and we become very lonely. It's a very lonely place. It's a very, very lonely place. And this is why the meetings are so important, because it provides this unity, service and recovery. The unity part is that the community, the fellowship. That's what that unity is all about, because alone we can't survive and even through life we can't survive on our own that's not how it works we are built we are meant to be together as a collective even now in in the things that i say i always try to send a message connect with the people you love connect with your family with your friends really build strong bonds and relationships built out of love light compassion kindness empathy because when you start to do these things and this is what i learned through the program is that unity people put their arms around me and they helped me because i was struggling and there was nothing more than i wanted but to get recovery and stay in recovery and that's what the unity part did. The second part, which is the service part, the service part of that book is in a triangle and it says unity, service, recovery. And it's one of the big things that that book talks about as well, even in the fellowship meetings, is about getting a service commitment. So committing to doing something and the service part is also about serving others, humbly serving others, whether you're a greeter, whether you're making coffees and teas, whether you're, you know, uh, putting the room together, you know, you're putting the chairs out and then you clean the room afterwards, whatever that may be, whether you're doing, you know, literature, which is all the books and, and the leaflets and the information about the 12 steps and the fellowships, all of these things, and you commit to doing it for 12 months. And for me, that was amazing because I like to commit to things. I like to give in my all. So for me, my sponsor said to me, when you take a commitment, you do it for the 12 month duration, and then you, you move on to another commitment. And that for me was like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. I want to stay clean and sober. So let's go. And even in life, Serving others is so important. It's so important to understand that being of service with love, with light, with kindness, compassion, empathy, being able to just listen to someone, pointing them in the right direction, opening the door for someone, all of these things that we can do that helps us to fill that love, that abundance cup. And that's what this is all about. You know, that service part was so big for me because I really wanted to also, it builds the unity. People get to know you because you're the guy at the front door saying, hey, how you doing? You get to meet newcomers or if you're making the tea, that's also something which is really good. And when I took a commitment that I really didn't want to do, which was making tea, I don't like making tea and coffee for other people, but actually at the end, I enjoyed it because I got into conversations. I got to hug loads of people, which is something I really like doing. I got to know people because you get into conversations. 
And it's such a wonderful thing to do for someone to be able to be of service. And it really taught me to be humble. It really taught me to get out of this negative self, which is what I got myself into through the trauma, the mental health, the addiction, the years of suffering. And this is what it does, that unity part, people put their arms around you, the service commitments allowed you to get out of self, allowed me to get out of myself. And the recovery piece, and that's the bit that takes the daily work, is working through that book with a sponsor, and then once you get to the 12th step, which is the is kind of the final step, but it's where the work really begins, you then have to do this every single day. And this is when you really embody the unity service recovery. And it's not just in the meetings where this helped me. I had to do this in my daily life too, because I didn't want to just go to meetings and spout. And I've seen this again, you know, things that can happen to some people, they memorize the book and they spout all these wonderful words. But then they're still suffering. They're still in pain. And and I, I'm not kind of judging. I learned from those things. Because for me, again, I made that conscious decision that I will not go back to that place. I don't want to go back there. So I'm going to do everything in my power to do the complete opposite. And that's what I did. I threw myself in. I followed the book, not other people's opinions, because people have a lot of opinions. And this is the wonderful thing that does make me laugh. And people mean well, but people come into recovery and all of a sudden they think they're a coach or a therapist without the qualifications. And often than not, people try to give advice that actually cause more harm than good. And this is something that I'm very mindful of because it's not my job to give anybody advice on anything, anything personal other than when we're working through the steps. If I'm working through that book, that's all I need to do. And this is the same applies in life. This is something that I really learned. It was such a a valuable lesson for me to not tell people what they should or shouldn't be doing with their lives because it's none of my business. And also I'm robbing you from having your own personal life experience, which is why you are here. You're here to have your personal life experience. So who the hell am I to tell you what you should or shouldn't do? There is no should or shouldn't. This is up to you. Now, what I can do as a sponsor, as a friend, as a partner, as a as a colleague, as a leader, as a coach, I can recommend things that you can do for yourself. I can guide you in the right directions through possibly asking questions, being a little bit inquisitive, finding out more, understanding your reasons why. So these are things that are so important, not just in recovery, but also in everyday life. And this this really, really helped me to, to really tune in when to, to, to jump in and, and help somebody and when to step back and allow that person to be ready. Because often or not, what can happen as well, especially when I came into recovery, I'm like a little puppy. I'm so excited that I'm clean and sober. I want to sponsor everybody. I want to do everything. I'm doing all the work. And they call it the pink fluffy cloud. And to be fair, I jumped on that pink fluffy cloud and I don't think I've ever come down. Because I, 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 Again, I don't want to suffer in my life. I realize that that's not what life is all about. So am I, how am I going to get down from that cloud? That's that's what it's there for. I jumped on it and I stayed on it. But here's the reality is that there is still going to be a lot of hard work. And that's what the 12 step is all about. And even when you're working programs or you're working with a coach or a therapist, when they're working with you and they're, they're giving you work to do, things for you to improve, to to apply to your life afterwards because in the meeting you're in a meeting for an hour an hour and a half max and then you got you know 23 22 and a half hours of your experience same when you come and see a therapist same when you come and see a coach same when you're coming to do breath work it's the same thing you have the majority of your time is you time so what are you going to do how are you going to make sure that you're not falling back And then constantly, you know, you're taking further steps back than you are forward. Now, look, when you leap forward, sure, you're going to leap backwards and sure, you're going to take some steps backwards. But you do that when you're looking at the things that you have been avoiding. And this is what's happened with me when I looked at the step work, when I had to go and look at my step four, which is looking at all the wrongs, all of my fears, all of my resentments, everything. And it's incredible how everything is laid out. 
And when I looked at all of those things and I was able to also look at myself, not from a place of victimhood, but from a place of truth. Wow. I was like, okay, I've made a lot of mistakes here, you know, and I've judged a lot of people too. And I've put the blame on other people when in fact, I was the one who was responsible for those decisions. A lot of the times no one made me sure they may have had their opinion, but I was the one that took the step. I was the one that took the action. So when I realized these things, when a penny started to drop and I realized that every single action I take in my life is on me, is on me, even take it away from, from the step work. In these seven years, this is what I've learned is that every single decision that I make is for me. It's all about me. So what decision do I want to make? What do I want to do with my life? When I wake up in the morning to the time I go to sleep, I'm in charge. It's on me. So I had to really learn to, to, to continue really doing that work. And I did, I jumped into the program, you know, I did all my daily, all my daily work, which is in the book, you know, and then I started to then, you know, take on service commitments. I started sponsoring, I started speaking and really allowing myself to, to be in that recovery triangle as much as I could. But one of the things that I realized as I continued in recovery is recovery doesn't give you everything. It doesn't. It allows you to become clean and sober. It allows you to go through the first layer of recovery. It allows you to really see the possibilities of life. It allows you to really connect with who you are in that moment. What it also does and what it also showed me is I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of work to do. Now, I have a choice whether I could continue doing this through the 12 step. It may work. It may not. For me, it just wasn't enough. And because the 12 step opened me up to saying, go and do more. What do you want to be? Who do you want to become? Like, this is it now. Like, go and do it, kid. Like, this is it. Like, the doors are open. And the more I trusted the process, the more the doors continue to open. And some, some doors open really, really fast, some of them a little bit slower. But I started doing the outside work. I started looking into healing. That's when I met Banti, who is the, the, the Buddhist monk. And I was looking for a, th a psychotherapist. I wanted to do some healing work. I knew I had some trauma stuff that I wanted to work on. And I found him. He was local to where I lived, literally two minute walk from my house. There's a there's a Buddhist monastery there. And I just turned up one day, had a conversation with him, turned up, started doing some therapy and we started to, to get on. And he said to me, do you practice meditation? I said, yeah, I do guided meditation. He said, do you want to learn some more? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So we go and do an hour's worth of, of therapy and we go and do another hour's worth of, of meditation. And he started teaching me all about it. And I started to then go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into self. And I started to then go further and further and further into that healing process. I started learning about breathing. I started learning about breath work. I started learning about stillness. I started learning about compassion, what it truly means, about empathy, about being able to be kind, connecting with unconditional love. And I started to go deeper and deeper. And again, it opened another door and I thought, okay, wow, I need to find out more. And then eventually, you know, through years, I then fell into doing breath work and then discovered the shamanic ceremonies, which I've, I've shared. And that for me was a hard one going into the shamanic work, working with plant medicines, because in the program, it says no mind altering substances. And that's something which, you know, I was really scared of because I didn't want that to have any impact in, in my sobriety. I didn't want that to have any impact on all this hard work that I'd done. And by this point, it had been years that I'd been in recovery. So I didn't want to undo all of that work. And my my sponsor, who I'd spoken to, I had a conversation with him and, and said, look, you know, what are your thoughts around this? And I'd done some work and and I'd met a few people who 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 were also in recovery, who, who were, who were doing this ceremonial work. And they'd explained to me, look, there's a huge difference between how we were using 
before because we were using to numb, we were using to hide, you know, we were you we were using to isolate. Whereas this, there is nowhere to hide and you're being held. And this is about healing. This is about you going so deep within that you're going to start to remove trauma and remove blockages and truly get to know who you are. And I thought, wow, again, I kind of just said to myself, all right, well, what's the worst that can happen? You know, let's let's do this. And I started to go into the healing journey, the shamanic healing journey, going into the shamanic uh, ceremonies. And that's where I really learned about breathwork. I was already kind of going into breathwork, but I really took another step into that, went into the breathwork and started working with plant medicines. And, you know, the first medicine I ever worked with with a medicine called bufo and for people that it's called the god molecule and i understood why <laughs> the shaman who who took me through it gave me a hero dose and uh after doing i think it was about an hour and a half of of breath work and and we went hard and i was pretty much already leaving my body and then i took this this bufo which you smoke and this is quite funny because i I've never smoked the two drugs I've never, never done was I've never injected myself and I've never smoked out of a crack pipe. But when you do the Bufo, it's actually in one of those little pipes. And I remember just giggling to myself and going, oh, wow, that's the first time I'm going to smoke out of that. But definitely not the same, definitely not the, the, the same drug, that's for sure. And my experience, I hit my head on a pillow and I left my body. I left my body and I traveled through realms. And I just kept traveling and traveling and traveling. And eventually I hit source. I hit source, the source of our creation. I hit source and I just exploded into this energy of the only way I can describe it in human form is unconditional love. And I became everything and nothing. And it was the most incredible experience I have ever ever had in my life and then I came traveling back again and just had these incredible experiences I traveled back in time to when I was a child and then came back into my body I thought I shot up and I had the prayer position and I remember just sitting upwards so I thought I did I sat up and said oh my god I've just experienced enlightenment and then shut my eyes back again and then laid back down I came to realize that actually I didn't do that. That wasn't me. That was my spirit body that experienced that, that experienced this connection with the source, with our true self, with who we truly are. But we're here to have, you know, it's individual experience. And the shaman then did a ton of work and he did a load of work on, you know, on, on my shadow side and pulled out a load of stuff and a load of trauma. And it was an incredible experience. And from then... I have then worked with with other plant medicines. I've done ayahuasca, I've done the mushrooms, and you know, and and it's completely, completely changed my life because what the medicines do is it allowed me to go so deep within things that subconsciously I was I'm not even aware of anymore. Like it's completely forgotten. And it's gone so deep into that subconscious because it's there to protect me. I was able to tap into all of those things. I was able to really look at that stuff. I was able to look at my my fears, really go deep into the things that I was scared of, the fears. And in one of my ceremonies, I was faced with, with the opposite of, of our creator, which is, you know, we call it the devil or Satan, that the opposite energy effectively. And I was connected to that. I was in a ceremony and I came around, I sat up and the shaman, became the devil satan whatever you want to call it and it was really interesting because i was staring at the shaman and he wasn't verbally speaking to me he was kind of through just through the mind through thought and i remember asking oh my god are you and he just kind of shook his head it just gave me like this knowing nod and i just sat there just kind of staring for what it felt like it was just hours and eventually it disappeared and I came around and shared my experience and and I had this incredible release and this beautiful release. And I came around and had so much gratitude and so much love because I started to realize that 
all of the things that I was fearing, all of this trauma, they were things that were passed down to me. They were passed down to me through my parents, through grandparents, through aunties and uncles and society. Society is constantly driving us into fear, into being scared of, you know, if it's not politics, it's a war. If it's not a war, it's a virus. If it's not a virus, it's something else. There is always something to be scared of. You know, and now we're we're all losing our freedom. There is something. There is always something that, you know, they're they're making people scared of. And I realized through those experiences that it's me. It's I. What am I scared of? And I came to realize through that experience is nothing i don't have to be scared of anything sure there are certain things that that do worry me sometimes and they do frighten me god i'm having a human experience so you know the, it, it's normal for us to to understand and, and have those processes but the truth is that they are an illusion it's not real because i understood and i got to connect not just once a number of times with that source with these incredible energy beings you know and some people call them some people call them angels some people call them guides some people call them tribes some people call them aliens whatever you want to call it i've had some i can't even describe into words some of the things that i've seen and experienced but let me just bring this back one of the things that i've been asked of me uh because i hold space and and you know when we're doing breath work and and it's been really interesting because People get frightened that they and they think, oh, you know, when you've worked with with you know with the medicines and you've traveled, you've done all of these things, you know, what about your recovery? Because you know, do you feel like you ever want to use again? That is the last thing on the planet that I want to do. It's the last thing on the planet I want to engage with. It is so far removed that it's not it's not even something I entertain. And for anybody who hasn't experienced it, when you go and experience it. The last thing you want to do is shove anything into your body that is going to damage you further. In fact, the one thing that it kept pushing me towards was the self-healing. And I allowed myself, I'm not one of these people that kept jumping into medicine. I allowed myself time to go through the healing process, to go into the implementation process, which is really important to implement the work after recovery, after, you know, uh, ceremonial processes, after any form of healing process, breath work, gongs, you name it, anything that's taking you out of self, that's allowing you to be really open you have to make sure that you're doing that integration process. And, and this is where my, you know, the, the coaching, the breath work, all of the things that I've learned throughout the years, I was thankfully, by the time I went into this healing process, the deeper healing, I was able to really and truly allow myself to, to do the integration process. And, and what I found in that is I cleared so many blockages. You know, I had sat with with ayahuasca a number of times now, and the, it's such a powerful medicine. It's such an incredible medicine. It's such a loving medicine. It's such a a, a harsh medicine sometimes, but what it does is it shows you truth. It shows you clarity. It removes the victim. It removes the fear. It shows you that stuff of what it really is. And when you allow yourself to see it for what it really is, an illusion, something that is not true, because I, the essence of I, the bigger sense, the bigger picture of this outside of this human form, this mind, body, spirit complex, I am unconditional love. I am unconditional lie. I am everything that surrounds that word unconditional love because the word, it doesn't even do it justice. That's how powerful we are. And when I started to learn and find that truth, I became so much calmer, so much more loving, so much more compassionate. And I was able to truly see that I am the creator I am the creator in this human form. And when I said earlier on about, you know, going, what the hell is God going to do for me? What the hell is Christ going to do for me? I was shown this is what it's done for me. I am it. And it was showing me, it showed I, every single, every single thing I've been through and everything made sense. 
And when I say to people, sometimes people get confused because I say to people, don't ever seek perfection. You are already perfect. Perfection only leads you to failure. It takes people a little bit of time for that to click. And when you understand, when you truly see who you are, the power, the gift of who you are as a man, as a woman, as that individual, and then you see our power as a collective, which is why we're all trying to be torn apart at the moment. We're all trying to be divided into these various different subjects, which I don't want to get into when you start to see that we are each other, we are all, and you allow yourself to truly connect with everything that you are, that's where you find that freedom. That's when you find that essence of eternity, because we are in this rat race of, you know, we're limited on time. You know, we've got to do things now, 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 you know, when it's all stress, depression, anxiety, and people are suffering with mental health. And, you know, if I can't buy a house, then I'm going to suffer. And, you know, the government's trying to tear us apart and this is happening. That's happening. There's a war and, oh my God, there is this. And, you know, there is this group and that group. And, you know, and one of them is proud. The other one is not. And but it's, it's such a headache. But when you find that truth within yourself, you realize that I am you, whether you are black, white, whether you are pride, whether you are LGBTQ+, it doesn't really matter. Like we are all one. But one of the things I always try to share and I always try to, to say to people, because I've had so many different conversations with people who are from different races, who believe in different things, whether you are vegan, whether you are gay, straight, pride, it doesn't matter. And one of the things I always try to to um, to share, to knowledge share, because that's what we're effectively doing, even through the chaos, we're knowledge sharing, we're teaching each other something. But the biggest lesson here is the lesson that we're learning through the vision is the pain that it causes us. When we get to the point that we see how much the division is causing us pain and suffering, and we start to collectively come together, you will then see the power of love. You will then see the power of freedom. You will then see how incredibly powerful and infinite you are. This human experience is temporary. We are eternal beings. This is an eternity. We get to do this as many times as we want. And if you didn't learn something now, you get to do it again. You get to learn something new. And that's the beauty of it. And you can look at that as a beauty or you can look at it as a burden. I look at it as a beauty. I look at it as an incredible experience. Why? Because I keep growing. I keep learning, growing, developing every single day. And I get to share that knowledge with my children, my friends, my parents, my wife, you listening, this is me knowledge sharing with you right now. And if you're learning, you're learning something right now. And hopefully the one thing you get to learn is the power of being clean and sober, the power of recovery, the power of love, community coming together. This is the essence. This is what a true man does. This is what a true woman does. And when we when we take away, when we destroy the labels, because that's what it all is. And that's where the division is created. It's creative through, it's created through labeling. The labels are what keeps us divided. You're black, I'm white, you're gay, I'm straight, you're this, I'm that, you've got blue hair, I've got brown. Who cares? Who cares? None of it matters. And the quicker that sinks in with you and you start to accept who you are, because that's the truth. We fight for acceptance. And that's what I was fighting for. I was fighting to be accepted. I was fighting me. I was suffering. I was in pain. I was angry at everybody for not listening to me when in fact, the number one person that wasn't listening to me was me. I wasn't listening to me. And when I started to listen to I, and when I started to listen to myself, and I looked at myself in the mirror, 
It didn't matter. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, do I accept me? Yes, 100%. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I don't need to shout about it. I don't need to tell the world about it. I don't need you to accept me for anything. I accept me for everything. And that is when the truth for me, that's when the penny dropped. And I've had so many of those. And then I learned to accept the challenges. The challenges in life are designed to help us to grow, to manifest into bigger things, into the greatest version of ourselves. And in turn, those challenges are then paid forward in unity, service, recovery, because you're recovering, you are healing every single day, not just the now. I've done so much healing and I continue to do past life, generational healing, transgenerational trauma, which is through family and friends and societal. And now I'm sharing this, paying it forward so you can go off and do your own healing. And that ripple effect of healing is incredible because it just explodes explodes and the love energy explodes further than anything dark anything negative and this is why now more than ever more and more of us are shining a light on love on connecting on being together on acceptance but first and foremost you need to find that truth within yourself when you find that truth within yourself, when you connect and you accept the challenges of life, because you are perfect, you are exactly where you need to be. But does it mean that that's where you're going to be forever? Absolutely not. It means that if you take the steps forward, asking for help, accepting help, doing the daily work, you will continue to grow and flourish every single moment of your life. And that's the power of being able to face your fears. Because when you face your fears, you overcome the fear. You see the fear for what it truly is. It's self-generated. It's self-generated. It's generated through the media, through social media, through negativity. Love is that positive energy, the, the energy that shines, that undescribable, that unconditional love that we can't even describe it because it's so powerful. Fear, resentment, that negative energy that we call the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call it. It's just simple, love and darkness, positive and negative. That's it. That's pretty much what it is. There's nothing else in between. But we make those choices because we are energy. Everything about us is energy. That's what we do. We provide energy to ourselves, to others, to this planet. So everything you do has an impact, not only on yourself, but everything around you. So if you're shouting and screaming and demonizing and judging, and I'm not saying that I haven't done it, I've done it. And this is something I work through because it's conditioned in us. But the beauty is, is just being able to see the truth that even that is OK. And when you accept the challenges, you face the fear and you never give up, never give up finding love, but find love within. That's one of the things I kept seeking things externally. And when I went into the, the 12 step, when I went into the ceremonial work, when I did the breath work, I was told continuously go within, go within, love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. I didn't understand why I thought I did. And I realized I don't do it enough. I need to do it more. I need to be kinder to myself more. I need to accept myself more for my haircut, for my beard, for the way that I look, for the things that I eat, for how I speak, how I communicate. And that's the same for you. And when you allow yourself, when you truly connect with who you are in every single essence, every single fiber of your body, 
you truly connect and see who you are and you will shine. This is where you really start to shine and learn that learning. It, that's what we're here for, to learn, grow, develop, learn to love yourself each and every day. That's what we are. I learn to be humble because I don't know everything. And in fact, I learn, I know nothing. I actually know nothing. And I learn around the power of education. And I don't mean the education system, because that's not, that's so wrong on so many levels. And as we've come to realize, it just creates slave and people who are easy to manipulate because what they teach you in the educational system is to remember, is to remember to comply and to say yes, yes, yes. And as soon as you start to learn to do that, everything else that's dictated through media, through social media, through television, everything, if you're so easily then susceptible to receiving that and going, oh my God, if these people are the ones who are teaching us that they must be telling the truth. When now, thankfully, we're all starting to see and realize that that is far from the truth. So humble yourself, become nothing and rebuild everything that you are. That was the greatest gift that was shown to me. I kept seeing myself through one of my ceremonies, just dying lifetimes and lifetime and lifetime and lifetime of dying, just becoming nothing, having these experiences and becoming nothing, having these experiences and becoming nothing. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, is this all I'm going to experience throughout? And it's, it was an Ayahuasca ceremony. So, you know, these ceremonies are throughout the whole night. These like six hours. And eventually when I started to realize what it truly is, and I accepted that, that's, that's our experience. We live, we learn, grow, develop, and we pass on. There's no such thing as death. We actually, we're rebirthing. We're going back home. We're going back to our true essence, what we really are. This, this form is not us, is not me. So actually, when my time comes, I'm looking forward to going home. So instead of fearing death, I actually, I embrace it. I'm looking forward to it, to the day. I'm not counting my chickens by any means because I've got so many things I want to learn, so many more things I want to share back, so much love I want to give to my children, to my family, to you listening. I want to love as much as I possibly can. And then when that time's over, I'm going to thank God, Christ, the, the my guides, my tribe, my spirit animals, you name it, every single one of you, I don't care. You're all going to get it. Just for giving me that experience, for allowing me to be here in this moment. And that's what so far seven years of recovery has given me. Can you imagine this in seven years? And I still have so many more years to go. So many more years to go. So imagine what you can do for yourself and learning all of these things to be humble, finding your path and your path sits within the heart center. You find that when you connect with yourself in mind, body, spirit, truly connect and you allow yourself to do the things that you love, the things that make you shine. We're in a system that is constantly driving us to be workers, to be slaves. We are slaves. There is no way out of it. Even me, I work in this system, but I am working towards hopefully connecting with more and more people that want to come out of this system. This system is expired. It's overdue. It's so old. It serves no purpose. And the more and more we allow this to continue, what's happening is they are now tightening the reins. They're now going to take people's homes, people's businesses. They're going to tell you what you can and cannot do with your money, where you can and cannot go. They're going to score you. They're going to tell you who you can and cannot be. You're going to become a real slave then. You're going to become a real slave then because if you don't do what you're told, your score goes down and you can't travel, you can't go anywhere, you can't feed yourself. What existence is that? Do you want that existence for yourself? Because before this was seen as a conspiracy theory, you know, and people were calling people, you know, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. And look at it now, even now I'm seeing it myself and going, oh, my God, this stuff's true. The people that these, you know, these conspiracy theories so-called or the truth seekers, you know, as I now see it is 
they're telling the truth and more and more of that truth's coming out. And the beauty of it is you cannot shut this down. You cannot shut it down because if you shut all of these platforms down, all of those companies are going to go bankrupt. And this is what people don't realize. They cannot survive without us. If you stop shopping at all of the major brands, if you stop buying all of their products and you go and buy local, you start to create your own jeans, your own shoes, your own trainers, and you start to service that locally. Where are these people going to go? Who are they going to sell to? And this is what the, the, the blocked mind, the mind who is, who is numb, the mind who is still under this form of an illusion into this system. This is what people don't see is that you are the creator. It's just that these people were very clever and hats off to them. They created this system and they're tightening and tightening and tightening this system up now because now they really want to control you. Whereas for me, I want a system that embodies abundance, that embodies us to be able to grow because this is where they fail is they think from a place of negativity. Because if you think from a place of love, unconditional love, that true essence it's abundant. It's infinite. We can create whatever we want. There is no, there is enough, more than enough for everybody, every single one of us. So even that lie, and this is something that I used to believe, even when I came into recovery, I used to see people that had multiple years. I never thought that was possible for me. And now I'm sat here seven years in, and I'm telling you, it is possible. And not just in recovery, in every single aspect of your life. But it takes daily work. It takes for you to break out of that system. It takes you to break out of that bondage. It takes you to do the healing work. And it is hard work. It is not easy, which is why people choose to sit in their comfortable pain. People choose pain rather than choosing to be on the other side. Don't ever give up. Find that path. Let go of negative people, places, things. This is something that's so important because when you do, you start to then, you open another door. The more you let go of the things that no longer serve you, the more you open the door to the things that are going to serve you most. You are attracting yourself to the things that are going to make you the best version of you. And that journey, as I said, it never ends. It's just how much more do you want from it? And because a lot of us, our self-confidence is so low, and this happens even in recovery, People get a little bit of recovery and they go, oh, wow, this is great. But they don't do the continuous work. So they fall backwards and they go back even further. And some people don't even make it back. And it's the same if you're doing healing work, whether you're mental health, addiction, you know, it doesn't matter. If you're doing any form of work on yourself in mind, body, spirit, continue. Don't give up. Keep going. Trust the process. Do that daily work. See how much more you can achieve. Because that's where you build self-confidence. That's where you build self-confidence, self-respect, self-love, resilience, and all of the challenges, everything that's there is just thrown at you to make sure. It's not even thrown at you. It's just given to you. You are manifesting these things yourself because you know you can do it. You are never going to give yourself anything you can't tackle. But it's about you trusting yourself that you can. And you only do that when you take the steps forward. Learning unconditional love. I think if there is anything that I want to share for now, tomorrow, or many days, years to come, is connect with true love. Connect with the essence of who you are. Really learn to understand what life is all about. I've shared so many things here that I hope it really helps you. And if it does, please share this with others. Share it to as many people as you possibly can. Because the more and more of us that learn to share, as my daughter says, sharing is caring. <laughs> she says it because daddy, sharing is caring. I was like, you're right, baby. Sharing is caring. 
So if you care, share this. Share this with as many people as you possibly can so they can benefit from this as you have. And then the more and more people that continue to spread this message because love, light spreads like wildfire. And we need this more and more. We need solutions to these problems. And we need to find also, first and foremost, the solution within. Because when you do that, you find that solution within, you start to realize how beautiful, how incredible, how magical you are as an individual. And then when we come together as a collective, regardless to what you believe in, because that doesn't matter as long as you believe in it, as long as you accept yourself, because when you do, you don't have to force feed anybody anything. People will accept you for who you are when you accept you for who you are. Trust the process, do the work and continue growing, learning, growing, developing every single day. That's why you're here and help others. Trust God, clean house, help others. These are such beautiful words. I love them. It really resonates with me in just being able to be the best essence of us that we can be. Thank you so much for, for listening, for being part of this show, this community. Share this, like it, leave your comments. Please rate this so we can get more and more visibility. Simply that's what this is for, is just so I can spread this message to as many people as I possibly can. If you want to find out more about me, then go to my website, www.alexdasilva.co.uk. Check out the Alpha Wellness app. Alpha Wellness app, you can download it on Google, you can download it on, on uh, iTunes, on Apple. It's available to download. It's completely free. I have all my programs, all my courses, meditation, breath work, yoga flows. Everything is there. And I'm constantly working and developing more and more content for you. And you can also listen to the podcast on the app as well. So I want to be, you know, create this hub where everything is there and it's all accessible to you. Have an amazing day, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And as always, be great. Be fantastic and be absolutely phenomenal today. And I will see you again very soon. Take care.